I'm going to ask you to do something counterintuitive today. When the world already feels chaotic and harsh and unpredictable, I'm going to ask you to question something that feels sturdy and good and reliable. I'm going to ask you to rethink the way you think about kindness. So let's start with a story. In the story, I'm about 25 years old and I'm doing something that feels really normal for me. I'm going grocery shopping. And as a wheelchair user, this looks different for me than it does for a lot of people. Uh, I've used a wheelchair for most of my life actually. So on this day, um, I'm carrying this giant tote on my lap and I have this perfect gorgeous system um, for how I arrange the boxes and cartons just right. Um, and I know it looks precarious to people, but totally routine to me. I mean, have you ever felt this way? You know, you're in the middle of doing something that maybe looks super complicated or confusing or hard to someone else, but really you've done it like a hundred times. So it's as automatic as brushing your teeth. That's how grocery shopping feels to me. So <clears throat> on this particular day, I've already been asked by a few people if they can help me. And I've already given a couple of like friendly, easy breezy, no thank you, I've got it. And I've made it all the way to my car and I'm about to load my groceries in when this man approaches me and he asks if he can help. And once again, I give this like warm decline. Um, but this guy responds a little differently. He takes a few steps back. He leans against the car next to mine and folds his arms across his chest and watches me. I assume so he can be at the ready when I inevitably need that help that I've already warmly declined. Uh, so I set to work with my every, everyday routine and I'm taking the wheels off of my chair and I'm throwing them in the back seat of my car. And then I'm pulling the body of my chair over me to sit in the passenger seat. And while I'm doing this, I can feel this man watching me and my hands are starting to shake. And I can feel this little line of sweat start to pop over my upper lip because I have to show him that I'm fine, but he's not buying it. And the faster I'm trying to move, the more I'm fumbling. And suddenly I'm fumbling at this very ordinary task that I complete every week. Um, and I just can't seem to get this tote up over my lap and into the car. So I do something that's pretty rare for me, actually. I break out of this hyper-friendly persona and I say, could you please stop staring at me? You're making me feel really uncomfortable. And <clears throat> this man doesn't say a word, um, but he moves back to the other side of the car, maybe like 10 feet away and continues to stand there. So now I'm taking these items out of my tote and throwing them into the car so I can just pull this through. And finally, I'm able to lift the tote up and over and I slam my car door shut and I drive away and I make it through like two lights before I just start crying. <clears throat> and I bring you to that story, not because it's exceptional, but because it's representative of so many encounters I have with people when I'm in public. And I bring you that story because I think it captures something important about the way that American culture seems to think about two things kindness and disability. As a disabled person, I feel this tight, like almost inextricable link between these two ideas. Like when my disabled body moves through the world, I become like a magnet for quote unquote kindness. And it can look like a lot of different things. Um, people running across a parking lot to open a door for me, people approaching me in a coffee shop or on the street to pray over me for my healing, uh, people offering me money when I'm buying snacks at the gas station, uh, people coming up from behind me and pushing me up a long ramp, or even people taking my son out of my arms and buckling him into his car seat. All of this is meant as kindness, I really do believe. Attempts to reach out, to connect, to alleviate perceived suffering or strain. It almost feels absurd to complain about this, right? I mean, who really complains about being with money or a few prayers? But imagine this with me, if you would. Let's say that you're like walking to school or work or the bus stop and 
someone stops you with this concerned brow and says, hang in there as they push a couple bucks in your hand. And what would that signal to you? Maybe I must look a little haggard this morning or do I look like I need a meal? Or maybe like imagine you're walking up a long flight of stairs and someone swoops you up in their arms and carries you to the top and you don't even know who they are. You didn't see them coming. Like maybe you're scared. Maybe you haven't even had time to think, but when they drop you up at the top, they give you this big smile and say, there you go. Like maybe if that happened once or twice in a lifetime, it would feel like this funny fluke maybe. But what if there was a good shot that something like that might happen anytime you left the house? And the truth is, in my experience, these moments feel like the opposite of human connection, like the opposite of helpful. They're painful, actually, because they affirm to me that I'm like this little symbol in a big story playing out in someone else's head. And that leaves me feeling disempowered, disconnected, and erased. So that's what I want to explore with you, that tension between intention and the actual experience of this kind of kindness. I'm a writer and I write a lot about being disabled, um, but when I bring these moments to readers, like when I call on uh, this kind of kindness into question, I'm consistently met with resistance, frustration, like sometimes even anger. And this is interesting to me. Like you might think that as a regular recipient of kindness, the bearers would be interested in the results of these kind gestures, right? But I think that we respond instinctually with resistance because we hold kindness close to our hearts. We reach for it as a defining characteristic to ensure that we're good people because kindness offers hope to humankind. I feel all of those things too. But what if actual kindness, like the kind of kindness that does good and feels good and makes tangible difference is more complicated than we like to think. In order to understand this relationship between <clears throat> disability and kindness, I think we have to pull back the lens a little bit and look at larger patterns. So when we look at the stories being told about disability in film or in literature or in the news or in charity through charity fundraisers, I think two things really stand out. And one is that the stories of disabilities are overwhelmingly told from the perspective of non-disabled people. And two, the disabled person in that story, whether they're a fictionalized character or a real human person, is consistently flattened into a one-dimensional stereotype. They're the hero or the victim, and they're rarely portrayed as anything in between. And these stories are embedded deeply in our culture, and we love them. I know we love them because we keep telling them and celebrating them from Charles Dickens creating the character of Tiny Tim almost 200 years ago to the viral news story about the cheerleader who asks the disabled kid to prom. And these stories are often what we call feel good stories. They're that spot of sunshine in the news that we can look to uh, and take a sigh of relief and feel that shred of hope for the human race. I mean, why on earth would I wanna take that moment of relief away from us. But when you peel back the glossy finish though, there are at least three glaring problems with these kinds of stories. First, they center the story around that non-disabled person and they reduce the disabled person to a plot device. I mean, we're watching Ebenezer Scrooge, the center of the story, transform under the inspiration of that secondary character, Tiny Tim or we're celebrating that cheerleader for asking the disabled kid to the prom. The second thing is that they don't allow us to explore the big picture. So we're so busy celebrating the non-disabled person that we don't even think to talk about the incapacitating 
stigma at play. When one person asking a disabled kid to a dance is somehow newsworthy. And finally, they perpetuate stereotypes of disabled people. They flatten vibrant, complicated humans into caricatures of helplessness or sensational achievement. In a way, disabled people are held at the great distance from the rest of humanity. These stories are with us when we go out into the world. Whether we're thinking about them or not, they're shaping the way that we interact with each other. And the part of the talk when people start to furrow their brows at me and get uncomfortable and someone inevitably says, what am I supposed to do? Are you saying I'm not supposed to offer a friendly hand? I can't open doors for people? I do that for everyone. What are the rules here? And I think that's a fair question. And I totally understand this anxiety. Uh, but first, I think it's worth interrogating our resistance to complicating our understanding of kindness. Like what does our current understanding of kindness give us? And I've, I've had to do some personal digging here uh, when I think about my own grip on kindness. And I've come to this conclusion. When we're granted access to the world in the way that others aren't, we often feel guilty. There's a discomfort in watching someone struggle when we experience ease. And we can alleviate some of that discomfort that we're feeling when we reach out a hand and pull someone along. But I think that if our discomfort is driving that interaction, we're focusing on ourselves and not the actual person in front of us. I think a gut reaction can do more harm than good. Like what form of kindness could give more to the people around us? Now, here's what I think. I think human beings are complicated and, and communication is nuanced. The point here is not to give you a set of rules to memorize about how to interact with disabled people or any kind of people, really. I've heard from a lot of folks with invisible disabilities, actually, who are met with skepticism when they ask for help because apparently they don't look the part of a person who needs help. Ultimately, I think we all suffer when human beings are reduced to symbols in a story that we think we already know. Instead, I ask that we pay attention to the human person in front of us, to deprogram that part of our brains that reduces humans to symbols that we think we can interpret. Slow down, wait, look, listen. If you really, if you really can't tell if someone needs help or doesn't need help, you can always ask. But whatever that person says, and this is important, listen and believe them. And I'll say that again. If you want to be helpful, if you want to be genuinely kind, you have to listen. We still might get things wrong sometimes, but my hope is that we don't let that discomfort of messing up make us throw up our hands and leave the conversation. I think I would be remiss if I, if I closed us out without talking about what's at stake here. I mean, is this whole talk just this giant overreaction to some uncomfortable moments I've had in Target parking lots? Uh, I've actually struggled to articulate what's at stake in this conversation for most of my life. Um, I mentioned that I've been a wheelchair user for most of my life and I've had moments like this for almost as long as I can remember. Um, but this last year, I gave birth to a son. And I, I actually have a picture of him um, to share with you because you got to get a look at this um, cute face. I think you probably want to kiss him. Everybody wants to kiss him. He has very kissable cheeks. This is a picture from Christmas this, this last year, just like a month ago or two, uh, in this room, actually. Um, <clears throat> and I've been surprised by how much clarity my son has brought to my identity as a disabled woman, because in some ways, you know, I'm, I'm the same person I was before. I live in the same city. I drive the same car, the same stores and appointments, and people still rush to assist me in the most mundane tasks. But now I'm doing all of that with this vivacious baby boy attached to me. 
And <clears throat> shortly after my son was born, I was watching this virtual panel of disabled parents and a disabled lawyer talk about the experience of being a disabled parent. <clears throat> and I learned that it's legal in many US states, including the state where I live, for a parent to lose custody of their child simply because they have a disability. No proof of neglect or abuse necessary. And um, I found it really difficult to breathe as soon as I heard that. Um, suddenly being read as helpless has higher stakes, right? And suddenly I'm able to see how these tiny interactions, these tiny encounters on the street and in cafes and grocery stores translate into the big picture. This is why I feel urgent. Because when we automatically and by default read disabled people as always helpless in need of our benevolence, we're not trusting them to be parents. We're not hiring them into leadership positions. We're not voting them to hold public office. We're not choosing them as romantic partners. There is more at stake here than awkward encounters or even hurt feelings. The stories we tell matter. And while the stories that we re receive shape the way we see the world, we actually have the power to tell different stories. Like anyone else, disabled people are capable and need help. Our competence and needs are unique. I don't know that I would say disability should be normalized exactly, but I do get, I do feel uh, urgency um, that we need to expand our notion of what a vibrant, valuable life can look like, what an independent woman can look like, what a boss or a leader can look like, what a nurturing mother can look like. A kindness that brings about meaningful ease and access will lead to sustainable, systemic, empowering changes that make the world more accessible for more people. When I think about what gives me hope for the human race, it's not this old version of quote unquote kindness. When I think about what gives me hope, it's our tolerance, our ability to tolerant, toler, tolerate the ambiguity of human connection and our resilience to grow and adapt and our methods of caring for one another. Thank you.